What you have to understand about ancient empires is that whatever their rationale, the reality is that these are organisms that live for conquest. These are organisms for whom tax collection and expansion really is their oxygen. These are the things that feed the lifeblood of the empire. Without these two, without continuing to expand your territories and therefore increasing the amount of loot in your coffers, empires begin to wither and die. The Roman Empire is exactly like all ancient empires. It stands and falls by its ability to conquer new territories. But in 9 AD, Roman invincibility took a severe beating. An entire Roman army, commanded by Publius Quintilius Varus, was defeated by a confederation of German tribes. It was a catastrophe, and it's become known as the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. Varus's army of three legions and nine auxiliary units was wiped out, wiped off the face of the map. That's more than a tenth of the entire Roman army gone in just a matter of days. We're told that the Emperor Augustus was shocked to his very core. He was horrified, he was grief-stricken, and he was furious. Um, we have painted a picture of him ranging through his palace, banging his head against the walls and crying out, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Twenty years before the defeat in the Teutoburger Forest, Augustus had already begun to deploy legions in the area. It was an area known then as Germania Magna. And it was a dangerous area, populated by independent, warlike peoples. Augustus had come to power by winning a civil war and defeating Mark Antony, but he needed clean glory. He needed to be killing genuine foreign enemies rather than fellow Roman citizens. So he embarked on the greatest period of expansion the Roman Empire would ever see. So they now occupy much of modern-day Turkey, the Middle East, North Africa, Hispania. They go right up to Switzerland through Central Europe. But there's this infuriating problem and that is the province of Germania. Augustus can't take the risk, the strategic risk, that turning to the east and fighting the Parthians will open up Rome to attack by Germans. The man chosen to command the army and to control and to suppress the Germanic tribes is called Publius Quintilius Varus. Varus was trusted but not one of the very best. He was the sort of second most reliable commander around. Actually, probably the character to watch in this campaign is somebody called Arminius. Arminius was from one of the royal families of the Cherusci tribe, so he was a German aristocrat, a German prince, but he was also a Roman citizen. Arminius's job within Varus's army was to lead the auxiliary cavalry. And this is a really prominent, really potent position to be in. Romans brought in auxiliaries in order to provide capabilities that Romans themselves could not fulfill. Overall, the army was at least 50% non-Roman citizen, 50% auxiliaries. They provided the vast majority of the army's cavalry, and they provided troops like archers, slingers, men who were specialist troops. It's clear that Varus trusted Arminius, counted him as a friend, perhaps in a slightly patronizing way, but Arminius had dined at Varus's table on frequent occasions. But in private, he is plotting and planning. He wants to steal back from Rome his homeland, Germania. Arminius plans very carefully. He creates a false rumor of rebellion further east, which lures Varus away. He does what a Roman commander should do. He stamps out any sign of rebellion by marching straight at it, putting on a show of force. When the Roman army moves, it has got to have scouts in front, out on the flanks, and behind the trailing elements of the army to ensure that they are not ambushed. Arminius and his cavalry abandon the Roman army to join and lead a Germanic revolt. 
The loss of the German auxiliaries was an appalling blow to Varus. But also, these men who've now left you half blind have gone and joined the other side. For the Germans, cavalry were the perfect troops to spearhead and ambush. On the battlefield against dense infantry formations, they have limited ability. But when a column is strung out on the march, then cavalry with speed and surprise can strike quickly and punch holes in the line, leaving isolated pockets of men for other marauders to come down and mop them up. The fighting lasted for four long days, and we're told that between 15 and 20,000 men were killed. Varus didn't behave like a proper Roman aristocrat. He gave in. Mentally, he collapsed. Perhaps he felt so betrayed by Arminius, this close friend of his who'd now turned enemy, that he gave up. And Varus took his own life early on in the days of battle. So Varus had lost, and that means that Rome had suffered one of the greatest defeats in its history. In the aftermath of the battle, you really feel the heat of the fury of these tribes against their would-be invaders, and the reprisals are simply brutal. The lessons of Teutoburg Forest are that tactically you need to keep your army balanced. You need to be able to maintain that diversity of troop types to meet any situation. Strategically, you need to make sure that if you're expanding your empire, you can support it to the front line of the borders. The Romans discover that a natural border is the best border and that the great rivers of Europe, the Rhine and the Danube, are the safest northern border the Roman Empire can have. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest might only have taken four days, but because this was a moral as well as a military defeat, it has never been forgotten. It was always this thorn in the side of the flesh of the Romans, and for those in Europe, it became this kind of watchword for resistance and for the possibilities of power. And so it's always been written about in history, in poems, in literature. Great paintings have been done of the Battle of Teutonburg, and we still talk about it today.